Hi guys, welcome to Learn to Fly Melbourne. I'm one of the instructors here and my name is Clement. Before we talk about how does the control works on an aircraft, we'll first talk about how does the airplane flies. The reason why the airplane is able to fly is because of the wing is generating lifting force that lifts the plane in the air. But how does it do it? Let's have a look. This airplane is the Learn to Fly's Diamond DA40 single engine aircraft which produces 180 horsepower. If you look at the shape of the wing, you can see the top section is curved and the bottom is flat. The curved top section will allow air around it to flow faster, whereas the air beneath the wing will not be affected. That's why the air down the bottom will be slower than the top. And air is an interesting property, is when it's travelling faster, air pressure decreases. So the top section of the wing will have lower air pressure, and the bottom will have a higher air pressure. Air moves from higher pressure to lower pressure, the higher pressure down the bottom will try to move to the top of the low pressure and the pressure difference will create a lifting force. This is the force that allows the airplane to be flying in the air. After discussing how lift is generated, we will talk about how does the control works on an aircraft. We will start by going through three axes of the aircraft. The first one we talk about is the vertical axis. It goes from the top vertically down, going through the center of gravity and the bottom. The second one, lateral axis. From the wingtip through the center of gravity to the other side of the wingtip. The last one, longitudinal axis. From the nose, going through the center of gravity to the rear of the aircraft. As you can see, all three axes would intersect at the same point on the aircraft, which is the center of gravity. This is the point where the airplane will rotate around when it is flying. And because we have three axes, we have three different set of control on the aircraft. The first one controls the movement around the vertical axis. It is the rudder. The rudder is at the tail section of the airplane. It is the vertical moving part of the fin. But how do we control the rudder in the cockpit? We control the rudder by the rudder pedal. If we step on the right pedal, the rudder will move to the right. This will point the plane to the right. But if we step on the left pedal, the rudder will move to the left. This will point the airplane to the left. And we call this moment, yaw. The second one we talk about is the lateral axis. How do we control this? By the elevator. The elevator is the movable wing at the rear of the aircraft. When you pull the control stick aft, the elevator will move up, which generates downforce at the rear. When that happens, the nose will be pointing towards the sky, and this is how we climb during flights. When we want to descend, we will push the control stick forward. The elevator will move down creating a lifting force at the back and the airplane will be pointing towards the ground and this is how we descend in an airplane this climbing and descending movement is called pitch pitch up pitch down the last one to talk about is longitudinal axis which is controlled by the ailerons it is located at the outer section of the wing we control the ailerons by moving the control stick left or right when we move the control stick to the left the left aileron will go up and the right will go down. And because the left aileron is going up, there will be less lift. On the other side, the aileron is going down, and there will be more lift. When there is more lift on the right than the left, the aircraft will turn to the left. When you want to turn to the right, we will move the control stick to the right. The right aileron will go up, and the left will go down. The upgoing aileron reduces lift, while the downgoing aileron increases lift. When there is more lift on the left than the right, the aircraft will turn to the right. We also call this manoeuvre roll. So what we have been discussing is the primary effect of the controls. Now, let's get on to the secondary effect. Let's talk about the rudder first. The primary effect of the rudder is yaw. What about the secondary effect? Now let's have a look at the forces that were experienced by the plane when it's yawing. Imagine there is an aircraft that is yawing to the right. If you look at the wing tip on either side of the wing, you will see they are travelling at different speeds. We know that because the left wing tip is creating a bigger circle than the right. Because the left wing tip covers more distance than the right wing tip under the same amount of time, we can tell the speed of the left wing will be faster than the right. As we know, speed and lift are positively proportional, which means when wing goes faster, it produces more lift. At this moment, the left wing will produce more lift than the right, which leads to the airplane to roll to the right. And that's why the secondary effect of yaw is roll. 
Step on the right rudder, or yaw to the right, followed by a row to the right. Step on the left rudder, or yaw to the left, followed by a row to the left. The second one that we're going to talk about is the lateral axis, which is controlled by the elevator. As we know, the primary effect of the elevator is pitch. However, in this case, for the elevator, there is no secondary effect. Because when we're talking about a secondary effect, we're talking about the aerodynamic effect, which in this case, there are none. However, when we are pitching up or pitching down, there will be further effect. Now, let's think of flying an imaginary aircraft. When we raise the nose of the aircraft, what it feels like for the aircraft is like it is climbing up a hill on a bike. When we are going up a hill, we'll slow down, but we'll get Gain height. Let's put this into perspective of an aircraft when it's climbing. It will decrease in airspeed and gain altitude. On the other hand, when we're pitching down, what it feels like is we're going downhill on a bike, but this time we're gaining airspeed and losing altitude. Last but not least, the longitudinal axis. The primary effect of the aileron is roll, and there's a secondary effect as well. When an aircraft is rolling and turning, the air will no longer be coming straight ahead because of the turn. The oncoming air will impact the tail at an angle, creating a force that is pushing the tail laterally, which also yaws the airplane towards the direction of the turn. And that's why the secondary effect of ailerons is yaw. When we're applying right ailerons, it will roll to the right, followed by yaw to the right. When we apply left ailerons, the aircraft will roll to the left, followed by yaw to the left. And those are the primary and secondary effects of control. We have talked about the three main controls on the aircraft. Now let's have a look at other ancillary controls. The first and foremost to talk about is the throttle. In fact, a throttle in an airplane or in a car is very similar. When we open up the throttle, the engine will get more fuel and air and will produce more power. But when do we need more power? When we are taking off or climbing, we will set our throttle for full power. When we are descending, we will pull the throttle back a little bit, reduce the power or even idle to let the aircraft perform a glide descent. The difference between an airplane's throttle and a car throttle is, instead of using our feet to control, we are using our hand to control the airplane's throttle. But where does it located in the DA-40? It is the black lever between two pilot seats. You guys can see there's a blue lever next to the black lever as well. It is called the RPM lever or the pitch lever. In a DA-40, we use that lever to control the propeller pitch angle, which is here. Because we have the pitch lever on a DA-40, when we increase power, we have to push the pitch lever all the way forward before the throttle, so blue to black. When we reduce power, we have to pull the throttle lever back first, followed by the pitch lever, so black to blue. Let's say we're now trying to go from a normal cruise to a fast cruise. When we add power, remember to push the pitch lever first, followed by the throttle lever. So blue to black. And let me demonstrate. Have a look at the gauges. 22 inches of pressure on the left and 2200 RPM on the right. We'll push the blue lever to 2400 RPM. Then we'll push the throttle lever to 24 inches. When we're reducing the power setting, remember the sequence is from left to right, black to blue, throttle to pitch. So we'll pull the throttle lever from 24 to 21 inches. Then a pitch lever from 2400 RPM down to 2200 RPM. Why do we pull the pressure down first to 21 inches? Because when we reduce RPM, the minimal pressure would increase and it would build up for roughly 1 inch back to roughly 22 inches. The next one to talk about is the flaps. The flaps are the trailing edge device between the body of the aircraft and the ailerons. However, compared to the ailerons, flaps can only go downwards, but not up. When we deploy our flap, not only it would increase the lift, but also drag. In a Diamond DA40, we have three different flap settings. The first one is flaps up, which means there is no flaps. The second setting, the takeoff flaps. When we are taking off with takeoff flap down, we are able to take off in a shorter distance. One thing to be aware of is takeoff flap is only allowed to be deployed when speed is below 108 knots. The third flap setting is the landing flaps. When we use the landing flaps, it will create more drag than lift to help us slow down to a safe speed when we are coming in to land. Same as the takeoff flaps, the landing flap has a speed restrictions and it's only allowed to be used when speed is below 91 knots. So we better check speed before we lower the flaps. 
The next one to talk about is trim. You may ask, what is trim? Imagine now we're starting a climb in an aircraft. To initiate a climb, we have to first pull back on our controls. However, if you want to climb for a period of time, we have to keep applying pressure on the stick, which can be quite tiring and quite inaccurate. Because of that, the engineers came up with a solution of trim. When we are pulling on the controls, we can move the trim back. As we're moving it back, it will alleviate the force we're applying on the control. When we are pulling back on the stick, we have to start to think of trimming the aircraft. In this case, we will move the trim back. And when we are trimming back, you will feel less pressure is needed to pull on the stick. You want to trim the aircraft until no pressure is required on the stick and the attitude is maintained the same and this is what we call the aircraft is trimmed. When we are on descent, the same method applies. When we push a control forward to lower the nose, we will move the trim forward as well to release the pressure that we are constantly applying. When you push the stick forward to lower the nose, trim forward until you don't have to push forward anymore and the aircraft will maintain the same attitude and that's how we know the aircraft is trimmed. The following part is a crucial part in our flight training. We go through this every time before we go flying and it's called Threat and Error Management. So what is Threat and Error Management? In this part, we'll be thinking of some of the potential threat that may impose our flight today, some of the potential errors that we may face, and some of the proper way to try to rectify those problems. And because we have two control seats on our aircraft, one for the student, the other one for the instructor, to ensure the aircraft is being controlled at all times, we have a procedure called handover takeover procedure. When an instructor is flying and they want a student to take control, they would say, you have control. And the student would say, I have control. And the student would start to take control of the aircraft. If the student want the instructor to take control back, the same applies. The student would say, you have control. The instructor would say, I have control. And the instructor would be flying the plane. This procedure is in place, so the aircraft is being flown at all times and also to minimize confusion. The second one is regarding the busy airspace in the training area. We're flying in the busy airspace in the training area during a lesson, and because it's uncontrolled, a lot of aircraft will fly in random direction, which means during our flight, we could be facing aircraft that is very close to us. That's why we have to keep our eyes out for other oncoming traffic. And when you see a traffic, instead of just pointing at them and tell your other pilots or your instructor, we have a specific way to do that. This is called a clock coat method. Imagine a full 360 surrounding the aircraft is like a clock. Straight ahead would be 12 o'clock, to the right would be 3 o'clock, behind the plane would be 6 o'clock, to the left would be 9 o'clock. If that's an aircraft straight ahead of you, we can say traffic 12 o'clock. The other pilot will be immediately notified and know how to take evasive action if appropriate. And that's it for today. Please feel free to like and subscribe to our Learn to Fly YouTube channel and our social media. I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.